Hello, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak at the conference, and I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, but I look forward to our live Q&A later this afternoon. I'd like to start with a very basic question. Why do we improve? To what end? What do you want as a result of your improvement activities? You probably spend a lot of your people's time and money improving certain areas of your business. But what's it all for? What's it all about? Why do we spend all this time and effort focused on improvement? I've worked for the companies who, whose logos you see on this screen. And improvement projects were always part of what we did each year. So we always had a list of things that we were going to do to improve. But one of the key lessons I learned when I worked with Dr. Goldrap was why do we really improve? What is the goal? Not only the goal of the, the company, which you may have read about in his book, The Goal, but what is the goal even of the improvement projects that we undertake? What are we really after? And one of the key lessons I learned from him, him is that even our improvement projects, at whatever level in the organization they're occurring, should be very focused on an outcome that we're expecting to achieve. So I'd like to spend just a little bit of time on that before we jump into Mafia Offers because these things are connected. In other words, why we would improve sales and marketing. The simple answer to the question why improve is to create more leverage. And by creating more leverage, I mean to be able to do more, to sell more with the same people and resources. If we could actually ship more or sell more with the same people and resources, that immediately drops to the bottom line. That additional throughput immediately drops to the bottom line. So if we take a look at this simple uh, P&L statement here on the left, I've got sales of let's say 1 million, truly variable costs in theory of constraints are raw materials and make, if you have any outside processes, but they vary by each sale. Uh, so we have 200,000 of truly variable costs that gives us throughput of 800,000 and then these fixed costs are a half million and in this example we have profit of 3 million. Well. I would improve so that I could better leverage these operating expenses. If I can generate more throughput with the same people and resources, of course, that's going to drop to the bottom line. So look at this example. If we were able to take our lead time from six weeks to, say, three weeks, so we improve our operations so that we go we're able to now complete things in three weeks, we can actually get more jobs done faster and we also have to be able to sell more. So one thing is to make the operational improvement. And the second part of it to actually generate the leverage is to be able to sell it. So in this case, sales doubled because we uncovered, we uncovered capacity and operations. We were able to sell more, double sales with the same people and resources. Our truly variable costs are proportional. That, give, that doubles my throughput. So I now have throughput of 1.6 million and operating expenses stay the same. This is the leverage. So most of our improvement is aimed at getting more leverage, being able to do more with the same people and resources. And that's actually a pretty good aim because look what happens to the profits. Our profits increase substantially when we can leverage our already fixed costs. That's a profit increase of $800,000. So that is very good leverage and a very good reason to improve. But notice, we have to be able to sell it. If we were able to improve our operations and take the lead time from six weeks to three weeks and not sell more, if we could not sell it, there would have been no improvement. We would have had the same sales with the same fixed costs. You could make the argument that yes, maybe you could reduce these operating expenses. Maybe you don't need as many people. You might be able to reduce these, but the most you could reduce is a half million and you can't reduce all of them. So it would have much less of an effect than what we had when we made an improvement and we were able to sell the capacity that that improvement uncovered. So now you might be thinking, okay, I understand why we improve, we create this leverage and then if we can sell the capacity we uncover with these improvements, 
great, we can have a lot drop through the bottom line, but is it really possible? Is it really possible to take a lead time, say from six weeks to three weeks? So what I thought I'd do is put, a, uh, put this graph in here that gives you some data. Now this is a bit dated, this was done in 1999, but it's the most recent study we have, but the numbers are still very valid today. So if we look at some of these data points, we see that revenue or throughput mean increase for the companies studied in this, uh, in this book, we had a 73%, and that's, that's not bad. We had a combined financial variable mean increase of 63%, on-time delivery increasing 44%, a lead time reduction of 70%, cycle times reduced by 65% and inventories reduced by 49%. So it gives you an idea that yes, going from six weeks to three weeks actually might very well be possible. Here's a couple more examples from my clients and this of course is more recent times. Here I have a, a client that substantially increased uh, the profits that they made and this is also showing the due date performance uh, due date performance increase of six from 69 percent to 96 percent and then uh, the number of jobs that shipped substantially increasing as well which means a lot more profit uh, here's another client also showing uh, the on-time percentage going up and dollar shipped going up so if you draw a line from the bottom of this dollar ship to the top you can see a nice jump in profitability so these kind of results are actually very possible in theory of constraints so those are all pretty impressive results but what are the effects of your improvements if you don't know how to sell more if you uncover capacity but cannot sell more because you don't know how to approach the market or get more market share, what is the effect? And it's very little. So very little drops through. The sales stay the same. And as I mentioned before, the only way to really have a bottom line impact is to start cutting operating expense. So make sure as you're looking at what improvement projects you're going to do, you're, you're tracing it all the way back to how does it tie to the bottom line. What are we going to improve? Is that improvement going to help us to sell more? Is it something that the market desires? And are we going to be able to sell more? Because if I make an improvement and I can't sell anymore, I'm going to have very little effect on the bottom line. If you're currently in the situation where you know you already have uh, more capacity, you could sell more with the pe people and resources you have now, even without an improvement, it can be pretty useful to do an assessment and to determine if you really do have a market constraint. So let's, let me ask you a couple questions and see if you might have a market constraint. If I could increase your sales tomorrow by 20%, could you handle the increase while being 100% on, on time to your first commitment? without going into firefighting mode and continuous chaos and at a competitive lead time. So you can't change your lead time. Sales are going to increase magically tomorrow by 20%. Can you keep up with it? Could you handle it? And of course, if the answer is yes, then you have a market or sales constraint. If the answer is no, then you really need to look at improving operations before we can really start to leverage your operations to sell more, to go out to the market with a good offer. So if you don't have enough sales and you could handle more based on the questions that we just went over and you have a good product or service, the problem could be any one of the following. It could be your offer, it could be how you present your offer. It could be your market, meaning your market may be too small. Uh, it could be the amount of traffic or leads that you get, or it could be the conversion. In other words, you have plenty of leads, but you're not converting them into sales. It could be any of these things. But where we start generally is the offer, because if the offer is not good, it's hard to track down whether it's any of these other items or not. So let's start with understanding our starting point. How do you today answer the question, why should I buy from you? So if a prospect walked into your office and just asked you this question, why should I choose you over your competitors? Why should I buy from you? How would you answer that question? So let's go ahead and discuss that for a minute. Let's pause the video and then let's take a minute or two at each table to discuss how you answer the question today of why should I buy from you? So after you have a couple minute discussion, 
then let's collect some of the answers and see what your answers were. And then when we come back, I will share what I think your answers were, what some of the most common answers to the question are. So I've asked this, why should I buy from you question of hundreds of companies and had probably thousands of responses over the years. And this is the most common list, the most common reasons people will say why someone should buy from them. We have outstanding quality and it's better than the competition. We have a great reputation. We get good results for our customers. We have very knowledgeable, great employees with low turnover. We're very responsive. We're very innovative and can help with fill in the blank. And finally, you can trust us. So some version of this is what most people say to the, to the question, why should I buy from you? What this means is that you sound the same as your competitors. And consider that many of you in the room are from different industries and you still sound very similar. So really, what choice do your customers have other than choosing based on price? Or worse yet, they could just delay the purchase until it becomes more obvious what they should do. So a Amalfi offer is where we start if we have a market or sales constraint and if certainly if you don't have the answer to the question of why should I buy from you. So what is a Amalfi offer? A Amalfi offer is an offer that is so good that your customers can't refuse it and your competition cannot or will not offer the same thing. Those are two very important pieces to a Amalfi offer. Unrefusable to your customer and something that the competition won't match. A Amalfi offer is also different from other terms you may have heard or may have used interchangeably. Uh, it's different from a competitive advantage or unique selling proposition or a value proposition. Sometimes those things can be Amalfi offers, but they usually don't meet the definition above. They're usually just somebody having a statement aimed at a specific part of their business, but they're really not an offer. So let me give you a couple examples of some Amalfi offers you may have heard of. In 2009, Hyundai came out with its assurance program, its Mafia offer. And basically what they were doing is they were allowing you to, if you lose your job, we, had, we were in an economic downturn, and if you lose your job, you could just return the car. And because of that offer, they were up 4.9% over the same period in 2008. And that was compared with about a 40% drop for car sales overall. So that offer allowed them to increase, take market share, even in a down economy. And I would make the case that this really isn't a great mafia offer because it was copied fairly quickly. So soon after they came out with that, it was a few months, uh, other car companies started offering sim similar things. In 2011, Hyundai followed up their 2009 offer with a new offer. This offer is now standard on every new Hyundai. It's future trade-in value guaranteed. I think they did this for two reasons. One was that their 2009 offer was uh, fairly quickly copied, but it was also very successful. So, so now they've come out with it, uh, the next generation of their offer. Now here's another example with AT&T cellular, cellular phones in the U.S. Um, they came out with rollover minutes. And initially, I thought that this was not going to be a very good offer at all because I thought it would be really quick. The other, the other phone companies could easily copy it. But it turns out that there must be some uh, technical difficulties to allowing these rollover minutes to happen in the computer system and tracking it. So it actually did a lot better than I expected. It was difficult to follow and there's still no competitor had matched it uh, since it started in, in 2003. Uh, but on the downside, they started taking away from their offer with what I call weasel words, meaning they, there was a lot of fine print to the offer. So this plan uh, had a bunch of restrictions added to it and a lot of small print that went along to it, along with it, which basically um, negated the, some of the attractiveness of the offer. Now this is an, an example of an offer I received in a postcard and this is from a company that uh, provides email marketing services and so what they want you to do is switch from 
whoever your current provider is, and I was using Constant Contact at the time that I got this postcard and they wanted me to switch over. The interesting thing about this offer, it's not a terrible offer, it's not great, but it's okay, but look where it is. It's way down here in small print on on this postcard. So they must have not been very sure of it or they certainly didn't want to make it a main part of their marketing. But if you have a really good mafia offer, you want it front and center, you want to make sure that it clearly can be seen. So here what their offer says, send us a copy of your constant contact invoice and we'll charge you half the price you're currently paying for one full year. After one year, you'll pay our refreshingly low rate based on your list size and standard pricing. So they want me to switch and they really don't take away any of my pain or fears about switching, but I do get to pay half for a full year. So this offer isn't great. Uh, rarely do we create Mafia offers based on price, and this one is solely ba based on price, and, and of course they have it hidden down here. And really, if, if you're wanting me to switch, I would prefer that they had some language in here about making the switch easier, how I might be able to talk one-on-one -on -one about switching from constant contact to their service, something like that. But these are some of the examples of what's out there. There really are not a lot of good, uh, what I would call mafia offers out in the marketplace today. Actually, there are very few. And some of the ones I shared with you today are some of the better ones, and they really don't to me, they really are not great mafia offers. They're okay, and in most cases, or if not all cases, they can be quickly copied. So let's talk about what a mafia offer is not, or does not. A mafia offer is not based on an innovation. We don't need a technological innovation generally. Uh, if we're gonna if we're gonna go out to with a new product to a new market, that is very very high risk. There's a lot of risk associated with that. In Mafia Offers, what we're looking for is we're looking for an offer with our existing products in our existing markets. So we do not require new products or new markets, and we don't need any kind of innovation. Now, an innovation, could it help with a Mafia Offer? It could, but it's not a requirement. A Mafia Offer is also not based on price, and it's not a little cutesy tagline. It has to be something unrefusable to the customer and something the competition cannot or will not match. And the longer period of time they cannot or will not match it, the better. A mafia offer is not a list of strengths or a cliche or subjective or offered by the competition. So if you want to develop a mafia offer, there are three things that we really need to consider to develop a good mafia offer. The first is what are your capabilities? So what are your capabilities and what could they be compared to the competition? So right now, you may not be able to deliver in three weeks. You may not be able to go from a six-week lead time to a three-week lead time. Uh, but what could they be? What might be possible? So take a look at that graph I showed early on and what might be possible to improve in your operations. So this has to do with your operations. What can we do to create a competitive advantage in your operations that we can then capitalize on? So what are your capabilities or what could they be relative to the competition? Second is how does your industry supply your products or service? So typically, whatever your product or service is for your industry, everybody tends to do things the same way. If, if there are minimum order quantities, everybody has minimum order quantities. If shipping is free, uh, shipping it tends to be free for everybody. So how is it that your industry supplies your products or services? That's the second thing to consider. And then third, what is the impact of your industry's capabilities? So you and your competitors, what you're capable of doing, what is the impact of those capabilities and how you supply on your customer? So what kind of impact does the fact that you have a six-week lead time, that you offer, that you require minimum order quantities or whatever those industry practices are, what impact do those things have on your customer? So let's go over an example, and I think you'll start to understand these three things a little more clearly. So I'd like to share this Mafia offer example with you that is from the Theory of Constraints Handbook, Chapter 22, my chapter called Mafia Offers Dealing with a Market Constraint. This is a great example because there are a lot of lessons to learn here. Now this is a custom label printer and they sell 
labels to regional size food and beverage manufacturers. So they might sell labels to a, a company that makes salsas, for example. And they don't make just one kind of salsa, they make several different kinds and put them in several different size packaging. So all their customers are buying multiple labels from them. Well, one of their customers uh, was a regional coffee roaster and they roasted several uh, different varieties of coffees. They added flavor to some like French vanilla and things like that and they put them in several size bags. So they're buying a lot of different labels. The first thing we want to do is we want to look at this label printer's capabilities relative to their competition. Now when we first started looking at that I asked the label printer, well what is your lead time? And they said, well two weeks. And I said, well, what's your competitor's lead time? And they said, about two weeks. And then I started asking about due date performance, and they said, well, they're in the low to mid-90s, and so was the competition. So they were very similar to the competition in their capabilities. And that's pretty common. So if you, when I first start working with a company and I start comparing their capabilities to the competitors, usually it's very similar. Because if you're much better or much worse, then you know. The market lets you know. So for this first consideration, the label printer was very similar to their competition. But what could they be? How much could they improve if we worked on it? So we implemented something called drum buffer rope, which is part of theory of constraints. And we, will, we were able to get their lead times down from two weeks to two days. And due date performance went from the low to mid 90s all the way up to 99 plus percent. And of course, that, that took about three months, but we were able to improve their capabilities relative to the competition. Now this, a lot of uh, people use Mafia Offer and Competitive Advantage simultaneously. I think these operational improvements, I would call those creating the competitive advantage. So by going from it taking two weeks to two days, they created a competitive advantage. And this offer is going to leverage the competitive advantage that was created. So the next thing is now to consider how their industry supplies their custom labels. So how does this label company and their competitors supply labels? So I found out that the coffee roaster was a good representative example to use. So I asked, started asking questions about this particular coffee roaster customer that they had. They said the coffee roaster would buy about 100 different labels for all the varieties of coffees that they produce as well as the different size bags. Then I started asking questions about well, what quantity do they buy and what are some of the rules around that. Well, I discovered that they, the printing industry uses a price quantity curve. Now, if you've ever bought anything printed, you're probably familiar with the price quantity curve. But just in case you're not, here's what it might look like. So the more you buy, this is the quantity and this is the price, the lower the price you pay. So if you want to buy a lot of labels, you can get a good price. And the incentive, obviously, from the printer is to get you to buy a larger quantity labels at one time. And I discovered that everybody in the industry was using this price quantity curve. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty well used across the board in all different kinds of printing industries, not just label printing. So the third thing is the impact on this price quantity curve on their customers and also the typical capabilities. So how are the label printers customers or prospects impacted by a two week lead time and uh, low to mid 90s due date performance and how are they impacted by this price quantity curve? So to figure this out, I went into the customer service department of the label company and I ask if they ever got frantic calls from customers who have stocked out of labels. And they said, yes, we get calls like that all the time. And I said, well, what's all the time? They said, well, we get two to three of those calls per week. So I said, well, does the opposite also happen? Does it happen that, you know, uh, somebody is buying so many days worth and it was pretty typical that they would buy about a six month supply so to get far enough down the price quantity curve they were buying about a six month supply and so I was asking about this coffee roaster again and they said yes that the coffee roaster has about a six month supply and I said well are the, sometimes 
you know, they should be calling and replenishing every six months. Are there some labels that they don't replenish every six months? And they said, yes, of course, that happens as well. In fact, they told me a story that the coffee roaster had just recently called a few days before, and they were frantic because they had stocked out of bags for Colombian roast, and they desperately needed them because they needed to produce more and get them out to the market. And so they wanted a, uh, they wanted the label printer to ship them uh, fast speed and pay the extra freight and all that. And the, the uh, customer service people at the label company asked them, well, while we have you on the phone, do you want us to also make some of the French roast labels? Because we've noticed it's been over nine months since you've ordered French roast labels. And they said, no, we don't need any of those. We have enough French roast labels for our grandchildren. Just send the Colombian roast. So the reason that the coffee roaster was ending up with too many of some labels like the French roast and not enough of other labels like the Colombian roast was because of the price quantity curve. See, the printing industry puts this price quantity curve out there and the coffee roaster looks at it and decides, well, uh, about six months worth, it'd be about the right amount that we want to pay for the price. Uh, you know, more than six months worth and there's too much obsolescence and that would be very limiting. So most people carried about six months worth. Now, in order to carry six months worth of labels, and most printers allow them to spread the quantity across all their labels. So if they're buying a hundred different labels and they're going to buy a quantity of six months worth, they're going to decide, well, how many of the French roast versus Colombian roast uh, versus regular uh, of each of the labels they're going to purchase to accumulate this quantity. And to do that, they have to forecast out how much coffee all of us are going to buy in the next six months and of what flavor and in what size bag so they can order the right amount of labels. And just what you expect to happen would happen. In other words, the forecast is wrong. So they end up with too many of some labels and not enough of others. And then they're constantly having to call and adjust frantic to get some labels. Meanwhile, they have other labels that are collecting dust. And this is the situation that their industry, through their industry practices, have put them in. So based on that analysis, we were able to develop a Mafia offer. Now I'm going to tell you what this custom label printer's Mafia offer is, but I'm not saying that this is your offer. Even if you were a custom label printer, this is probably not exactly your offer because your offer is specific to your capabilities versus your competition, to your specific industry and the niche that you're in and how your specific customers are impacted. Okay? So this is specific to this custom label printer, but I think it's a good example. So let me tell you what their offer is. Oh, and by the way, to create this offer, we did it in two and a half days in one of our Mafia offer boot camps. So this is definitely the condensed uh, version, the condensed story of this. Their offer was, Mr. Customer, don't give me orders. Your orders are based on your best guess of how many labels you think you're going to need. We put that price quantity curve in front of you and force you to have to guess out six months of how many labels of each of your labels you're going to need. The forecast ends up being wrong and how could it possibly be right? Instead, tell us every day how many labels you use. Now if you'll do that, we can guarantee on the one hand that you won't need to hold more than two weeks worth of labels. And you know how your marketing department's always wanting to make changes and do different things depending on what's going on in the market, but you can't do it because you have six months worth of labels? Well, now you only have two weeks worth and you only have two weeks worth of cash tied up as well. In addition, we guarantee that we'll never stock you out. We'll guarantee that you'll never go to the shelf and not have the label you need. And if we ever do, we'll pay you $500 per day per label. Okay, now let's analyze it. Is it a Mafia offer? Well, is it unrefusable to the customer? The customer is going to go from having to take and tie up cash for six months worth of labels, and now they only have to take two. Now, that's a pretty good deal. We could say that for probably most people, uh, that's pretty unrefusable. Can the competition match it? Well, let's think about that. What was their lead time? The competition's lead time was two weeks and ours was two days. And remember, we backed it up with a uh, penalty guarantee. 
So if we don't have it on this, the shelf when they need it, we're going to pay a penalty. But because our competition's lead time is two weeks and ours is two days, we should always be able to have what they need on the shelf, particularly if we're getting daily consumption data. So that part's good. Also, the competition has a, let's say, low to mid 90s due date performance and ours is now up well over 99 plus percent. So they're telling us every day what they've consumed. It takes us two days to replenish anything. So it's gonna be very tough for the competition to match it and feel good about matching it if they wanted to also match our penalty. So what did it take to do that, to go from lead times of two weeks to two days while sales remain constant? How is it possible? Well, I've already given you some uh, idea about how you can use theory of constraints to have these kind of improvements. Uh, but basically what this label company did is they implemented what you have probably have read about in the book, The Goal. There's a process called drum buffer rope in there. And I have my own version called velocity scheduling system. They implemented these techniques and they were able to substantially reduce the lead time. So the time it takes to get through the shop went from two weeks to two days. But what else did it take? They actually had to fundamentally challenge how they did business. Remember that price quantity curve we talked about? Well, why does it exist? Why is it that every printer uses a price quantity curve? Well, as it turns out, it's to save setups. So if you ask most printers, how much does it cost to do a setup? They'll tell you to the penny. And it really doesn't though cost anything to do a setup. You might lose a little bit of paper and ink and in trying to get the printer lined out. So maybe that little amount of cost of that amount of raw material, but it doesn't really cost anything. It takes time, but it doesn't cost anything. And so their competition, of course, they're going to hear the offer and their immediate response is going to be, well, they're going to go out of business. They're going to have to do a lot more setups in order to keep the right labels in stock. And that's true. They will have to do a lot more setups, but their costs are not going to increase. But remember also that we went from it taking two weeks to two days. So we uncovered a lot of capacity and we can now use that capacity to do more setups and to be able to make these offers. Now, another interesting thing happened is that we started doing more setups. And so instead of the mindset of trying to set up the machine and let it run for several days, and we started doing these offers and we started doing these setups, we actually got better at doing setups. So what used to take 40 minutes to do a setup, we got down to about five minutes. So despite the fact that we started doing more setups, the setups that we were doing actually took less time. And so it actually turned out to be a really great advantage. The competition thinks these guys are crazy for doing it. So they, they not only can't they match it because their lead times and due date performance aren't as good as ours, but they don't even want to. They think it's absolutely crazy. The label company had the same mindset as their competition. So they had to rethink their costs and financials and how they think about those things and really challenge their thinking to go out with this offer. The fact that the competition can't match the offer and that they won't, they think that the printer's costs are gonna go up and they're gonna go out of business is extremely powerful. So the second part of the definition of a mafia offer is something your competition cannot or will not do. This is a great example of that. And the, the more you can find things that are counterintuitive to how the rest of the, your industry does business, the more longer lasting your mafia offer will be. Literally this offer, I've, I've given this example at printing conferences. I've spoken to a, several different printing con, uh, conferences over the last uh, few years since I worked with this client. And still today, nobody has copied the offer. Absolutely nobody, because it's so counterintuitive. Okay, but the question you probably have is, but what are the results? Because the, the point I made early on was we do improvement to create leverage. So we do operational improvements to create leverage, and then we create a market offer so that we can sell the capacity we've uncovered. So how did we do it that? Well, the printer's profits went from break even to a 20% return on sales within about three months. And the sales and profits that since doubled 
and profits went up to 25% of sales. And then really interesting, during the uh, tough economic times in around 2009, they continued to grow. It was at a slower rate than before, but they continued to grow. And that was because if you think about it, if there are tough economic times, manufacturers still need labels, uh, but they're less likely to want to buy six months worth. So if you had a choice, you're going to buy from a label printer that's going to require you to buy six months worth and tie up all that cash when you don't even know what your sales are and they're hard to predict. Or would you prefer to buy from somebody who says, no, buy two weeks worth, tell us what you consume, and we'll make sure you always have what you need in stock. So during the tough economic times, the offer became even stronger. So what are some of the benefits of Mafia offers? Well, obviously they increase sales. So we know that there's that financial benefit, but they also answer the question of why should I buy from you and give your salespeople actually something to talk about that does make you unique and different. A Mafia offer also guides the strategy and tactics for your entire company. You, you know who you are, you know what your offer is and how you're approaching the market. It's very clear that if you're going to make a mafia offer, you need to be able to say what you're going to do and do what you said when you said you do it. And this becomes a very key part of who you are and how you approach the market. So it becomes very important in your strategy and tactics for everything that you do within the company. It also forces operational improvements. So for example, if you create a mafia offer before you actually make the operational improvements, it certainly gives you a strong, compelling reason to go ahead and make the operational improvements. A lot of times uh, we will work on mafia offers not knowing exactly what operational improvements would really have the biggest bang for the buck. So we can develop a mafia offer and based on that determine what operational improvements uh, need to be made to be able to deliver that offer. And finally, it helps you sell the capacity you've uncovered through your improvements. So if you are doing uh, improvements, then let's be able to leverage them. Let's make sure that the, we're selecting improvements that uncover capacity so that we can do more with the same people and resources, and then let's be able to sell that capacity. Some of the other benefits include uh, changing the culture of the company. So you, you have a culture now where it is important to uh, position yourself in a market and be very clear about who you are and what you deliver and how you deliver it. And these are very strong cultural changes that occur within the company. A good mafia offer can also recession-proof your company. So in that example with the label company, the fact that their customers went from having to hold six months of inventory to two weeks, uh, that allowed them to continue to grow. They did not lose uh, business like everybody else did. They didn't grow as, a, as uh, the same rate, the rate slowed slightly, but they continued to grow. And so they were very recession proof. A good mafia offer can also help you recover from a cash constraint. So I've worked with people who are really tight on cash and we've created offers where we can go out and collect the cash and stay in business and then look for longer term uh, mafia offers and improvements from there. And finally, uh, a combination of the operational improvements needed for the offer and then the offer itself being able to sell the capacity that was uncovered provide huge bottom line results. Uh, this is truly big leverage. The, the amount that drops to the bottom line can be as big as what I showed you in that early slide. So in summary, if you don't sell the capacity you've uncovered through your improvements, you've accomplished nothing, meaning no bottom line effect. Focus your improvements on creating a competitive advantage, something in operationally that gives you an advantage over the competition, and then create a market offer, a mafia offer, to sell your competitive advantage. Well, I hope I've challenged your thinking today, both on how you consider what improvements to do, but also how those improvements can help you to create a mafia offer and then create a truly unique positioning in the, in the marketplace. So I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A later this afternoon.